Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to give um, folks a few more minutes to join the call. Um, Judith, do you think we are ready? It's about 11.03. We've got 11 um, attendees. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining our Tennessee Advocacy COVID-19 Update webinar. Um, we're so thankful to have you on. Uh, I'm Jessica Tuggle. I'm the uh, Manager of Field Development for Tennessee. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just talk about briefly share our mission and our mission objectives. If you want to move the slide. Do we have someone who can change the slide over? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and one more. All right. <laughs> okay, let me. Um, and go, go back one more, Judith. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. We love our Zoom life. Um, so our mission as Autism Speaks is dedicated to promoting solutions across the spectrum and throughout the lifespan for the needs of individuals with autism and their families. We do this through advocacy and support, increasing understanding and acceptance of people with autism, and advancing research into causes and better interventions for autism spectrum disorder and related conditions. And now our mission objectives, we have five that we focus on mainly. Um, that is increasing global understanding and acceptance of people with autism, being a catalyst for life enhancing research and breakthroughs, increasing early childhood screening and timely interventions, improving transition to adulthood, and ensuring access to reliable information and services throughout the lifespan. So again, thank you. I want to turn it over. Well, actually, sorry. So our Nashville Walk on Wheels, very exciting to announce that we do have a plan um, for our walk that is normally in Nashville at Nissan Stadium as an in-person walk. This year, like most things, we are changing it up a little bit and having a walk on wheels, our car parade. So we're really excited. It's gonna be Saturday, Halloween, October 31st. Uh, we're gonna share some more information, but would love for you all to come out. We'll send out registration links and all of that good info um, and more information to make sure that you know that we wanna keep everyone safe. Uh, with the walk on wheels option, of course, there's uh, going to be a lot of virtual fun. We've already talked to some teams who are going to walk in their neighborhood. Um, and we have some different incentives with flags and car kits, all sorts of things. Also, of course, hoping that while you wear your mask, you'll wear your Halloween mask on top of that, if you'd like, and celebrate um, Halloween. So more information to come. Of course, reach out to me at any point. Um, and we are looking forward to it. Uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Judith Orsetti. She is our State Director of Government Affairs, um, and she and the team are going to provide us with all the wonderful advocacy updates. All right. Thank you, Jessica. And let me apologize from the get-go. Um, I was actually um, forwarding the slides, and one of our panelists was trying to log in and having some trouble. So. 
I was multitasking and a little distracted. So Jessica, I'm so sorry for the slide snafus, but anyway, we're so appreciative that you're all here with us today um, and that we're gonna be able to talk about what's going on on the federal level and the state level. We've got some really special guests for you today. So stay tuned, it's gonna be a good day. Um, but here's our little language around disclaimer. This is not legal advice. We're just trying to share good information with you. So just keep that in mind as we move along during this presentation. All right, so I actually am the mom of a 16 year old son who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. Um, a few years later, he was also diagnosed with um, a severe intellectual disability. He also has OCD. So we've got, that sounds like alphabet soup, doesn't it? He's so much more than that. He's an amazing person. Um, but I say that to all of you to say, in some ways, I feel connected to you and the experiences that we've all had over the last few months. And I've definitely been talking with many of you about that. There are folks from our autism response team and community outreach on the webinar today too, who've been hearing these stories. And what we're hearing about is, you know, bam, school was closed um, back in March. And it just seemed like it came out of nowhere. We'd heard the news stories about COVID and then all of a sudden our lives were turned upside down. This also happened with adult programming, with day programming, with the healthcare clinics that we access um, for things like speech, OTPT, perhaps, perhaps applied behavior analysis therapy or psychological or psychiatric services. Many of us had to shift to telehealth and for some that was such a gift um, and it's just easier, more convenient for others. Accessing that screen and connecting is next to impossible and it's been really challenging. Um, accessing mental health supports during this time has been challenging. I will say I actually, as a mom, um, wanted to do a better job as a mom. And so I started seeking mental health support during this time via telehealth. And I have a weekly check-in um, with the counselor. And I encourage all of you not to be afraid to do that. It's important, it helps. Um, lack of connection to the community. Please forgive all the personal stories here. Um, but just another example, every Saturday for the last, I want to say 10 years, my son Jack has asked for wings. Um, and what that means is he would like to go to Outback Steakhouse and get chicken wings and see the wait staff who he's really connected with. You know, he walks in the door at Outback, they know him. Um, and it's just something that he really looks forward to every week, seeing his friends, eating his wings, having that experience. Um, and that connection has been gone over the last few months. We have gotten wings to go. Don't worry, he has gotten some wings. He's a teenager, he's got to have his wings. But that's not the piece that's missing. It's our amazing wait staff, the host, the manager, the community that value Jack as a person, and that's gone. Um, so just an example of that community connection. I know many of you are feeling those same disconnections. Um, community employment has been disrupted, you know, and so many times an individual who's autistic might have worked for a long time to integrate into the community, to provide those meaningful employment skills and a great opportunity. And, you know, all of a sudden that was disrupted. Respite, which is so important for our families, has been disrupted. Routines are disruptive. The big one we're hearing about a lot too with our autism response team is just loss of income, financial crisis. What can families do? Um, challenging behaviors can really spike when people are isolated. And it's kind of one of those things I think that people are afraid to talk about. They don't want to speak negatively about their loved one. Um, or if you have autism, you might not want to talk about those behaviors that you deal with, um, but they're hard um, and they seem to spike during these times. Um, access to health care has been scary at times. We hear stories about rationing of health care or people not being able to have loved ones with them if they're hospitalized. Those things are frightening for our community. And then right now, everywhere we go, people are so concerned. I know Nashville Public Schools has said they're going virtual. People are trying to decide what's best for their student who's on the autism spectrum. Should they be in person? Is there an option for that? Is it better for them to stay home and healthy and safe? Is that isolation damaging? Are they gonna regress? Gosh, it's hard. It's really hard right now. So all of these things are informing our advocacy in Washington, D.C in Tennessee, 
And if there are other things that we're not thinking about, please let us know. I want to let you all know that you're muted. I apologize for that. We're just trying to, to save bandwidth and make sure you know we're heard and you can hear us and see us. So forgive the muting of video and sound, but we do want to hear from you in our chat box. So if you have something to add to this list or if you have questions, we're going to stop throughout the presentation um, and take questions and talk with you. I do want to emphasize a couple times during the webinar that you know we will respond to chat, but also please know that we have an amazing autism res response team, one of Autism Speaks best kept secrets. They're really incredible human beings that monitor the chat box, the phone line, the email, and they are here to help you and they have so much expertise. So please take advantage of our autism response team. Um, they are angels here on earth and are here for you. Okay, that's enough for me. I do want to kind of let you know what to expect for the remainder of the webinar. As I said, we've got some very special folks that are going to share some really good information with you. Jessica, thank you for opening things up. Jessica is on the ground in Tennessee. Please think about participating in the Walk on Wheels. That would mean so much um, and should be a really fun event on Halloween. Okay, so thank you, Jessica. Just in just a few minutes, we're going to go to a federal advocacy update. There's a lot going on in Washington, D.C., even just today. And so hopefully we'll hear the latest and greatest. I'm going to introduce Karen to you. Or actually, I'm going to have Angela Lolo, if you're on. I think I'm going to have you introduce Karen, if you don't mind, in a minute. Angela Lolo is also part of our federal team. Um, and she's going to be talking about all the D.C developments which really do affect our lives it, it seems like it's it becomes so much more apparent about how things that happen in dc really do affect us the swamp affects us um, i'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on on the state level and share that with you and then janet williams who does community outreach and also works on the diversity and inclusion for autism speaks is an incredible person and she's got a lot of good inf information to share that's community based that we want to make sure you know about. All right. So deep breath. That's enough for me. Um, Angela, are you there? Angela Lolo? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, Angela's here and we can hear you loud and clear. So I'm going to mute myself. And if you wouldn't mind, I would love it if you would introduce our very special guests and then you both can talk with us about all the DC gossip of the day. Yeah, so I'm so glad to have my friend Karen Summer here with me. So I'm Angela Lello. I'm the Senior Director for Public Policy at Autism Speaks. I'm one of our federal lobbyists here in DC. I'm in the swamp, well, I'm in Northern Virginia. It feels like a swamp today. Um, and I will uh, apologize in advance. I'm a mom of two children with autism who are home with me and I have secured my area. But as you all know, um, sometimes plans go awry. So if there's background noise or a special visitor to my room, I apologize in advance. But that's my disclaimer. We have with us today Karen Summer, who is a very special um, friend of Autism Speaks, friend of mine. She is the health policy director for Senator Marsha Blackburn. And Karen has been working in Congress since 2011. Is that right, Karen? And before that, she is a Navy trained um, physician and she's also a parent and she has worked for um, Senator Chuck Grassley and the Finance Committee. She was the Health Policy Director for the Senate Finance Committee, which oversaw Medicaid, Medicare, and lots of other important policies for our community. And so Karen, thank you so much for being on the way. And in just a minute, we'll hear more from Karen, um, but I will just go over real briefly um, what has been going on in Washington, DC. And then I think Karen will be able to give you a better snapshot of today and what's happening this week, as well as what Karen might be doing um, for you all in DC. So when the pandemic really started to hit, Congress acted swiftly. They passed three different pieces of legislation all in the month of March. And we've been sort of referring to these bills as COVID-1, COVID-2, COVID-3, and um, we're moving now on to COVID-4. But the first um, three bills really laid the foundation for the federal response to coronavirus. The first um, 
piece of legislation that Congress passed, if you want to back up right there, there you go, was in March 6th. And really what that did is it provided a shot of federal funding for emergency healthcare response. It was over $8 billion, and it was really just to sort of um, boost the public health response early on. Then um, in the middle of March and towards the end of March, Congress really started looking at the bigger issues, people closing businesses, people getting unemployed, people um, needing to take time off of work to care for a loved one who's been sick or to care for a child who doesn't have their normal source of care. So in the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, or what we call COVID-2, Congress included paid sick and family medical leave. They also included an increase for Medicaid funds, and this would be, you know, an across the board 6.2% increase in federal Medicaid dollars. And they did include additional funding for healthcare emergency response. The third package, or CARES, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, is really, I think, the bill that probably most of you all have had a direct touch and direct impact from, or at least you're probably the most aware of this one, because this bill included the individual financial assistance to help Americans, both in the forms of individual um, economic impact payments or what people were calling individual stimulus checks, as well as a paycheck protection program to help small businesses and businesses that have really been struggling to deal with some of the economic shutdown as a response or as a result of coronavirus. So um, there was a lot of money in this package. It also included direct funding to state and local governments, over $2 trillion in um, funding for state and local governments, as well as billions of dollars in education relief funds that are going directly or that have gone directly to schools, as well as educational relief funds that governors of every single state have access to, to help um, spend on expenses that would help their school system recover. And none of these were specific to students with autism or students with disabilities, but the governors and the school systems have a wide range of flexibility. And Judith is gonna explain how we're trying to make sure those funds go to our community. Then um, in April, there is a little tiny bill that was passed. I say tiny, but it actually included quite a lot of money to extend the Paycheck Protection Program and some other healthcare funding. And this was just really to um, keep those programs whole and keep them going into the late spring. Then on the next slide, um, we, we have an outline of what was passed most recently, or COVID-4. So we are now in the middle of COVID-4 negotiations. In May, the House actually passed their version of COVID-4, which is known as the HEROES Act. There is a lot of money in that bill, over $3 trillion of federal spending for things including um, federal funding for a variety of different programs, additional, a significant amount of additional state and local relief dollars. There's also an additional individual stimulus payment for 12, uh, of $1,200 for all Americans, but one of the things that the HEROES Act does is it um, provides an economic stimulus payment for the adult dependents of taxpayers that were eligible for the first round. The other thing of note that Autism Speaks is particularly supportive of is the additional funding for home and community-based services, which are the primary funder or source of things like respite, residential programs, even some supported employment, day programs for adults. So HCBS are an incredibly important system for our community and the HEROES Act does include some targeted increased funding for those systems. It also includes an additional um, pot of money for schools um, sort of across the board, which um, you know, are all things that the House included in their bill. However, the Senate still has to take up this package and um, the Senate, as I understand it, but hopefully Karen will be able to tell us a little more, are beginning their negotiations in earnest. We heard that the majority leader, Senator Mitch McConnell, was going to unveil his starting proposal. Um, at, I had heard it was going to be unveiled to the larger caucus um, as late as today. So right now it could be happening. I know some people might have seen it in advance. And so although the path is a little unclear, we know that the goal 
the stated goal is to pass the coronavirus package number four before Congress takes their break, which starts on August 8th. And there's a lot of moving pieces. And if you go to the next slide, Judith, um, what I wanna highlight for everyone is what is Autism Speaks asking for? So Autism Speaks is asking for really three top priorities. Additional funding for those Medicaid home community-based services and additional funding to meet the educational needs of students with disabilities. We know that schools are having a difficult time responding to this situation and they need the resources to be able to address all of the concerns and help provide educational support in a safe environment. Then the, big, the third big priority of ours is making sure that we're expanding access to telehealth services in an equitable way and in a way that maintains access to healthcare for everyone. In addition, we've also been fighting to protect the rights of students with disabilities. There's been some um, advocating to Congress to try and weaken IDEA protections because of coronavirus. We've been fighting to stop that. And thus far, we've been successful. We're also fighting to make sure that $500 economic impact payment goes to dependent adults. So as I mentioned, the stimulus that was passed earlier this year in the CARES Act provided $1,200, roughly $1,200 for every um, most individual taxpayers. And if they had a child dependent under the age of 17, they got an additional $500 per child dependent. However, if they had an adult dependent who was age 18 or older, I know a lot of you are parents of adults with autism who you might claim as a dependent on your tax, you do not receive any um, direct payments for that dependent. So we're hopeful that the final package will address this inequity so that a, a parent caregivers, family caregivers who care for adults with um, autism and other disabilities will get the same relief as all uh, parents in America. And then the other big success um, we've seen is that, you know, the emergency paid and sick and family medical leave that was passed early on this spring um, afforded parents of children access to this paid and sick leave. We were very happy that the Department of Labor um, issued a rule that said this leave also is available for parents of adults who may have the normal source of care and parents of um, older children with disabilities who may rely on uh, systems that have been shut down. So we're very happy to see that. And the other real um, positive thing that has come out of federal agencies was rulings that say you can't discriminate um, in treatment decisions based on a disability. So um, that's something that we were very happy that the Federal Department of Health and Human Service issued and um, we'll be continuing to monitor those two um, those two developments. And a lot of our priorities have been championed by the Congressional Autism Caucus that has members from both the Senate and the House. And there are two co-chairs of that caucus in the House, uh, Representative Chris Smith and Representative Mike Doyle. And the, um, those are the two co-chairs of the Autism Caucus in the House. And um, we have a lot of good folks in the Senate that are also helping to champion. And one of them, it's Ms. Karen, Karen Summer, who I'd like to go ahead and turn it over and she can highlight some of her work and um, talk to you about things that are important to their office. Thank you. So hello everybody. Sorry, my other line bing just as I <laughs> took the hand off here. Um, first of all, uh, thank you all for having me and I also want to just uh, mention Angela is uh, a terrific advocate for the um, autism community. She is always uh, so well prepared and knows, knows her stuff and it's always a pleasure to work with her. Um, a little bit about myself. So uh, in addition to working uh, in the swamp, um, I'm actually a developmental pediatrician and the mother of a 30 year old woman with Down syndrome. Um, because of my daughter, um, uh, I became involved in healthcare and disability policy uh, 10 years ago. I did a fellowship uh, through the Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation, and now I find myself 10 years later continuing to work um, uh, on the Hill. Now I work for uh, Senator Blackburn. Uh, she is uh, from my home state of Tennessee. I am so 
thrilled to be uh, working for Tennesseans. And I just want to talk just real briefly about uh, a couple of things uh, related to COVID. Um, the first thing I want to do is just, um, in addition to thanking you for having me, I want to thank uh, my husband, uh, Marshall Summer, who is the Chief of Genetics at Children's National. Uh, he's given me um, some unpublished data on their experience with telehealth, and I want to talk a little bit about that later on with you all. Today, my goals are to um, just uh, uh, talk about Senator Blackburn's priorities, uh, an update on telemedicine, as I mentioned, and then some closing remarks. Uh, Angela did a great uh, uh, overview of the, um, uh, well, there's four bills, but they're called uh, 1, 2, 3, and 3.5 um, uh, bills for uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the grand total of these four bills is um, $2.3 trillion. And I know when people talk about trillions and billions of dollars, sometimes, you know, my head blurs, my, my vision blurs when I think about that. But to kind of put that in perspective, we have spent $2.3 trillion on the coronavirus so far. Um, and that compares to the annual uh, budget for the entire United States is 4.4 trillion. So um, we're talking about a lot of money has gone out the door uh, from Washington, D.C. Not all of it has been actually dispersed to people. Yeah. Um, uh, I just want to mention um, you may hear in the news about something called Section 1135 waivers. Um, this refers to the broad set of flexibilities that are in the Social Security Act in Section 1135. And these waivers are important to people with autism because, among other things, they have impact in the Medicare program, Medicaid, and CHIP program. Um, the purpose of the 1135 waivers is to help ensure that during um, emergencies or disasters, the healthcare program enrollees can access healthcare. Um, what, a couple of the things that we have seen from the 1135 waivers um, in this particular emergency is that we have um, seen uh, a much greater use of telehealth, including the ability for people to receive telehealth um, from their home. Uh, there have also been changes to enrollment for both uh, beneficiaries and providers in both Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. Um, there is a website uh, where you can learn more about these 1135 waivers. Um, it, it is www.cms.gov. Uh, and if you look around, uh, you can find information about coronavirus waivers. So Senator Blackburn's goals in all of this, um, first and foremost, the thing that um, kind of is the overarching goal is that she wants the best possible outcomes for all Tennesseans. And uh, so while it's necessary to invest, she wants to know where the money is being spent and if it's effective in meeting that goal. And she also wants to make sure that some of this money that's going out is actually received by Tennesseans. And she, um, when she's doing her county uh, town hall visits, uh, she always mentions grants.gov. And I uh, recommend that you all look at grants.gov. I know Angela's familiar with it. Make sure that you're looking for grants that you might be eligible for. Um, in addition, um, our office has put together uh, grant packets related to coronavirus, and we're happy to share those with you if, if you're interested. Um, some of the other things that um, are uh, kind of directing uh, Senator Blackburn's work right now is the pandemic has um, exposed that we have an over-reliance on um, other countries for pharmaceuticals and medical supplies. And uh, Senator Blackburn wants to see some of that manufacturing brought back to the United States so that we're not so dependent on other countries. She has a bill called the Sam C bill that is um, securing America's medicines cabinet, which would create um, centers of excellence for 
pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, in different places in the United States. And this is one of her priorities to include in a phase four uh, piece of legislation. She also wants to see um, protections for schools, businesses, nonprofits, anybody who might um, come up against a frivolous lawsuit because of COVID-19. Um, she wants to make sure that people have access to health care, no matter what their zip code. So she continues to fight to make sure there's funding in any package for rural areas, which um, uh, have higher incidences of uh, poverty as well as poor health outcomes. Um, she also is a, she has been for years an advocate for telemedicine and she is continuing to do that. She would like to see many of the uh, waivers that were done under the 1135 process made permanent uh, to uh, allow telemedicine to continue to work uh, its uh, magic, so to speak. Um, she also wants to highlight what Tennesseans are doing uh, to not just fight COVID, but um, how they are um, uh, coping. And it, I found it very interesting uh, how you've changed your walk to a walk on wheels. And that's an example of how uh, the volunteer states can, uh, you know, kind of make lemonade or make, what is the story? Um, you know, make, making things better when you have a bad situation. But um, there's other examples. Uh, for example, um, we've had some of our distilleries have um, started making hand sanitizer when we've apparently had shortages of that. Uh, in addition, we've had other companies that have started making ventilators when that was not their line of business at all six months ago. And then, of course, um, Vanderbilt um, has been on the front line of uh, coronavirus research for decades, and uh, they're very much involved in uh, clinical trials um, of the vaccine or of a couple of the vaccines that are um, hopefully going to be available before the end of the year. And finally, I would say um, Senator Blackburn wants to see kids back in school, um, but this is you know, for some kids, this is going to be in person, and some kids, it's going to be distance. And um, one of the things that she has advocated for such a long time is uh, rural broadband, and that has implications for access to school as well as access to telemedicine. So uh, just a little bit about um, telehealth. Now I'm just going to switch directions a little bit. Um, telehealth um, is one of these things that's I think it, it may be the only silver lining we have seen in this um, pandemic. And the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, but it, uh, it has been uh, very helpful uh, in terms of um, the things that have been learned from uh, doctors at Children's National Medical Center. Um, they switched their entire practice, the genetics division switched their entire practice to telemedicine uh, mid-March. And uh, of course, many of the patients that they see in the genetics clinic also have autism. So that's why I wanted to share this with you. The, and the lessons that they learned were, um, they were able to evaluate patients in natural environments. And some of the doctors actually said they saw patients that they had seen for years that they had no idea of their developmental ability because the behavior in the clinic was often not really reflective of what they would do at home. Uh, the doctors also said that the ability to pull the extended family together for a meeting was, um, gave a lot more information to the uh, doctors. And, felt, and they felt like it really was helpful for families. And these are families that uh, can be separated for a lot of reasons, extended families that are just, you know, uh, live in different parts of the country, or for people that um, uh, parents are deployed overseas, they were able to participate in these visits for the first time. And uh, they even were able to have um, parents participating in these uh, meetings where there had been 
a divorce or a separation. And so by having the meeting virtually, uh, they were able to actually have both parents there if they couldn't possibly be in the same room together. Um, they, uh, the doctors also noticed that they increased the frequency of visits for some of their most complex patients. Um, and those visits um, could not have been uh, uh, more frequent um, had they been face-to-face. -face. It was scheduling difficulties in addition, um, uh, just bringing uh, those medically complex folks into the hospital uh, increase the risk of developing COVID. So they were able to actually increase the number of visits for these patients without increasing their risk of getting sick. Um, they, uh, the dietitians had an interesting comment. They said they were better able to manage their patients because parents could actually take the camera and show them what was in the refrigerator and what was in the pantry. Um, so the doctors also reported that their team morale improved and their cohesion was better and they felt like continuity of care for their patients was better. Um, they reported a significant drop in the no-show rate and um, there was a great reduction in the wait time for our first appointment. It went from 40 days to three days because of telehealth. Now all of these things are great, but I hear what you said is great if you have ability to access it. If you don't have ability to access it, it, it doesn't help. And one of the things that is preventing some folks from doing, uh, from accessing telehealth is access to uh, broadband. And so Senator Blackburn continues to work <clears throat> on uh, broadband access as a priority issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the things that, um, uh, some of the other things I just wanted to um, close with, and this, I'm stating obvious here, that people with autism have the same needs as other people. And the CARES Act has um, enacted provisions for temporary relief for things like mortgages, student loans, credit card debt. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has resources that can help you there. There are protections and um, uh, policies put in place for housing and the Department of Hous Housing and Human, excuse me, Housing and Urban Development also has resources. And I always want to um, uh, make sure that people are aware whenever we're talking about the amount of money that is being spent, there are going to be fraudsters and scamsters out there. And um, they're looking for people who are vulnerable to take advantage of. And so I caution you to be careful of any kind of fraud that might be out there. The uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the IRS, Department of the Treasury, the Federal, Trans uh, Federal um, Communications um, uh, Department, all of these have uh, uh, information on the websites about uh, different activities that are out there that um, are just complete fraud. And finally, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for um, allowing me to be here today. All right. Thank you, Karen, so much. You are a wealth of information and Tennessee is so fortunate to have Senator Blackburn and you advocating, providing information, and this has been extremely helpful. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, um, Kelly Hedrick, who's our Senior Director of State Government Affairs and Grassroots Advocacy is monitoring the chat. Kelly, are there any questions that we need to answer before we move on in the presentation? Hi, Judith. There's one question that is getting at um, care. Uh, are there any programs available for families where parents have to go to work but don't want to risk their kids going to in-person school? Uh, this individual has a nonverbal sibling that it's hard to know when he's sick until physical symptoms appear, but um, income hasn't been the same and affecting his therapy costs, so there's stress on the family to uh, get back to work and struggling to figure out how to have care for him.
That's a tough one. So I don't know, Karen or Angela, if you know of anything about perhaps, did they say how old this person is? Um, I don't see an age, no. Okay. It would really depend on whether they fall, you know, in, in the child category or adult services category. Um, Angela? Oh, six, six years old. Six. Okay. Yeah. So they can't, oh, I think you did mention that they can't go to school right now. Um, Karen, I don't know if you have anything to share so, on that. Angela, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do think that that is one of your goals is to increase the funding in phase four for home and community-based services. Mm -hmm. And that would, that um, program such as that they're looking for would fall into that category. So my, I can tell you that you know, I will take that message back um, for negotiation purposes, why, why we might need more funding for home and community-based services. Um, in terms of how that's played out in Tennessee, that's up to people in Tennessee to figure out mm. where those programs are. And we can talk about that a little bit too as we talk about what's going on on the state level um, with the state legislature and agencies. Um, and also, I would ask that um, our autism response team, if possible, if you could get in touch with them too, because they might have some real specifics. It's an issue that really has come to the surface for so many families over the last few months. Um, so our hearts are with you and we need solutions and for this. So. Are there any other questions, Kelly, before we continue? Yeah, Judith, one other one popped up that I know you'll be talking about um, early intervention, but there's a question of, does Medicaid cover the cost of ABA therapy in the place of in-school early learning that's now hampered by COVID? Yep, well actually, we can talk about that. As many of you know, applied behavior analysis is now covered in Tennessee by private health insurance because of um, a bulletin that was issued um, and Tennessee was actually the 50th state to enact autism insurance reform. So that is being implemented right now and certainly we know in Tennessee and many other states when children are not able to access early intervention in person or when they aren't able to access school-based services, many are opting to try to access um, applied behavior analysis and speech and OT and other things through their health insurance um, if those providers are essential in nature and can do in person. And so I would ask this person as well to contact our autism response team and we can talk specifics about how that healthcare has rolled out in Tennessee. Um, so, and with that, I think I'll roll on forward to our state section um, unless there's anything else, I don't want to miss any questions. Okay. No, we're handling the other ones in, uh, in the chat. Okay. All right. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm the parent of a child on the autism spectrum, a teenager, um, a sassy teenager sometimes. Um, and um, I'm also Director of State Government Affairs at Autism Speaks. I've been with Autism Speaks for going on 12 years. And we've worked on the state level across the country on health insurance reform and other things. Um, when COVID popped up, boy, we heard from our community about many of the things that Karen's already spoken about, which are so important. Healthcare, home and community-based services, what's going on with special education and early intervention. I do want to let all of you know that we're going to send out a copy of this presentation afterward and it has active links in it that you can click through to actually get to some of the pages Karen mentioned when she was talking for further information. So just know you're going to have a resource to click through and we'll also put a recording up that you can watch if you really want to experience this visually again. Okay, so quickly, let's talk about healthcare. Karen mentioned the 1135 waiver um, in Tennessee that was approved back in March and again on June 9th. And it does things um, for those who utilize TennCare, Medicaid, um, to make access to healthcare and the coverage of it easier. Um, so just different things like pre-admission screenings, they're making it easier, modifying that provider enrollment process. Um, and then allowing for services to occur in alternative settings. I know Karen mentioned telehealth before. For specific information about what Tennessee has been approved for in these 1135 waivers, 
If you're on TennCare, if that's your health insurance, click on that link at the bottom where it says find additional information and it gives you really extensive information if you want to geek out on the details with what these 1135 waivers do. Um, Medicaid um, is covering telehealth, as Karen mentioned, and back when the crisis started, federally, CMS came out and said, we want to make sure people have access to telehealth. Um, and the most recent update from TennCare indicates that because of the executive order of Governor Lee in Tennessee, the public emergency has been extended to the end of August. And so these telehealth provisions at least are going to be extended to then. And I know there's conversations about trying to make sure they're made permanent in Tennessee. Um, the private health insurers have kind of acted separately. The governor did put forth with regard to telehealth and other things, um, but with regard to telehealth that we're talking about right now, he issued a bulletin or an executive order um, early on and the um, Tennessee Department of Insurance issued a bulletin and the language is a little fuzzy. It said some insureds may be using telehealth services instead of in-person health care services. Um, and the governor kind of said he urges coverage of telehealth by those st state regulated private health insurance plans but like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Humana, others. Um, and they're doing that. Blue Cross Blue Shield actually just came out recently and said they're gonna keep doing telehealth. What we have to monitor is the are they covering telehealth for the autism community and the services we need, like psychological services, psychiatric services, um, trips to the pediatrician or the doctor, speech therapy, occupational, physical therapy, applied behavior analysis therapy, those things, you know, we need access to telehealth too. So the legislature tried to pass a bill during session and there was fighting about it and opposition. So it did not get over the finish line. There is talk in Tennessee of a special session and telehealth is one of the things they're talking about considering. So we will keep you apprised. We certainly are trying to monitor this because we know it's important for our community. I do want to provide the caveat too that telehealth is not a, an end all be all replacement for that critical in person contact with your physician, with your therapist. Um, but we know it's so important for people right now who can't access those clinics because of COVID or perhaps people who just struggle to in general because of their location or maybe anxiety or other issues they experience related to autism that precludes access to in-person. So it's a good option. It's meant to be another option, not a replacement to in-person therapy or medical services. Okay, moving on quickly. Um, if you use those home and community-based services that Karen and Angela both kind of talked about, um, the waivers, so you'll know those as like the statewide waiver or the CAC waiver, the Tennessee self-determination waiver, those are waivers that many Tennesseans who have disabilities, developmental disabilities, autism access, and during this time of emergency, there was an application to CMS through this tool called Appendix K, and it allows for some flexibilities. So it increased cost limits for these waivers. I don't know if any of you use the waivers or if you've experienced that increase in your limits. Um, temporarily modifies service scope. Um, service limitations can be exceeded. Um, Different settings can be utilized. The provider qualifications have been modified a bit just temporarily so people can more easily access these home and community-based services that we've talked about under those waivers. I also, I'm, I apologize for rushing a little bit, but I do wanna make sure you know that we're monitoring what's going on with the school issue, which is so complicated for our community whether it's safe or not for our students to be there in person, um, what they're being told by their school districts about only being virtual. Um, the school, the Department of Education in Tennessee um, is working on this, but of course the guidance is vague and it's complicated. Um, what I would encourage all of you to keep in mind is that if your child has an IEP, those services still have to be provided and it's totally appropriate for you to request that they be provided 
in an individual way for your student. They're an individual, they have an individual education plan. It does make them a little different than the typical student without an individual plan. Your individual plan is based on an entitlement. And so this entitlement means you can have a free and appropriate public education when the schools are open. So, and it's even a little bit more intricate than that. So communicate the best you can with your school district, with your teachers, tell them what you need. If you need in-person, request in-person. Even if they're saying, we're not doing in-person, that doesn't mean you shouldn't request it for your individual plan. Those are just examples that I'm giving you. If you have a student who you're worried about sending back and you want them to pursue remote, request that. Um, there's flexibility with IEPs and we encourage our community um, to ask for those things as you are able to. Money has come down from the CARES Act. Um, as Angela and Karen mentioned, a lot of money has come down and there was a fund um, actually the Governor Lee had access, access to called the um, Governor's Discretionary Fund or the Governor's Emergency Education Fund. And so he received $63 million to allocate um, towards education in Tennessee. He also received um, specifically for K through 12, 257 million and for post-secondary education, 223 million. We focus on the governor's discretionary fund and the things we're advocating around for that funding is we'd like for our students to have access, um, the right hardware, software. Um, and I know Senator Blackburn has acknowledged this issue as well, um, but we wanna make sure if you're living in a home with multiple children or there's you know challenging economics or um, you know, you don't have access to Wi-Fi where you live. Those things are critical. Um, we want to make sure that little ones that are in early intervention, shifting a little bit, are going to be properly transitioned into special education. And if they need extra time, we'd like to see that. We're so worried about the services that you all are talking about not receiving right now um, from your IEPs. And we want to make sure that those are delivered. It's not the fault of the schools that there's a pandemic. You know, there shouldn't be bad guys here, um, but it's really important that we not let special education students, those on the autism spectrum, be forgotten in these conversations. They need to access the services they haven't received that were missed um, that are on their IEPs. And then we're also concerned too about transitioning out of special education. What's happening to those students? Are they receiving the transition services that they're um, entitled to? So. Those are some things we're working on. We appreciate your feedback there. Please do stay in touch with us. Go to our Facebook page, Autism Speaks Advocacy, and follow it. We post there regularly about advocacy that's occurring on the federal and the state level. If you're on Twitter, I'm sorry, God bless you. <laughs> it's a really complicated space. We are there um, at Autism Votes. Please follow us and engage. And we're also on Instagram too. So. I, we're not Snapchatting yet, but we're in all the other places. So please engage with us. And also you can follow us and what we're doing on our website, autismspeaks.org slash advocacy. Um, so with that, I know we're short on time and I wanna make sure Janet has a chance to share community resources. Um, are there any pressing questions, Kelly, or can we move on? Um, I will just note that there's a question being concerned about the potentially harmful effect on development of a child with autism if the parent chooses online, which eliminates interaction with other students. So yeah. I would suggest checking in with our art team to see if they have information on, I know that's a valid concern and it's a balancing act of what's best, you know, for the individual child. Um, yeah. That is, let me see if there's, I think. I think the other one can be addressed uh, in the Q&A box. Okay, thank you so much for monitoring that, Kelly. And these are really important questions that we'll respond to. And you're right, development and regression that is being um, experienced because of those who cannot access education virtually is a huge issue. Many of our um, students with autism have repetitive behaviors or challenging behaviors that make it very hard for them to attend to a screen they need in-person learning. So that's a reality and we have to balance that with health and safety. Um, and it's 
very important for our families and for people with autism that we find that balance and we continue to work to find that balance. I, I always tell people, and it sounds super negative, the reality is there are not a lot of people out there that care or know, you know what our autism community is experiencing that are making these decision, think, decisions. Thank goodness for people like Karen and Senator Blackburn's office who do know and acknowledge and are working for us. So thank you guys for participating today, for sharing your questions. And I would encourage you again to stay connected with us because it's exhausting. This life is exhausting. There are many challenges right now, but now more than ever, our advocacy is so critical to make sure that the autism population has the support and the individual kinds of service that they need. All right, so with that, Janet, I want you to take your time and please share um, with our community the things that are available to them through Autism Speaks. So, Janet. Thank you so much, Judith, I appreciate it. Again, my name is Janet Williams. I am the Director of Community Outreach, uh, as well as the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Lead for Autism Speaks. Um, but more than anything, I'm the uh, parent of a very active 11 year old um, who has an autism diagnosis. Um, and as everything that we've talked about and they've shared so much from the state and the federal side, um, since this COVID pandemic hit our communities um, from the start, Autism Speaks, we've taken some swift action uh, to respond to the immediate needs of people with autism and their families. So in response to the news of the rapid spread of COVID-19 among each of our communities, um, as we just shared, you know, we've been urging lawmakers at the local, state, and federal levels to take immediate action uh, to protect uh, and to provide resources and services for our communities. So I just want to share that if you visit autismspeaks.org and on that home page, um, if you wait a second, there's going to be a yellow banner that drops down. Um, and on the top of that page, uh, there is a link embedded in that yellow banner. And if you click that link, a lot of the resources that I was going to talk about, but I'm not because, you know, uh, for the sake of time, uh, please visit um, that, that website and visit that, you know, click on that link. The information that is shared on that site is so helpful uh, for our families, providing resources and support. Uh, and it's updated constantly. So please make sure uh, you visit the, the COVID-19 resource page. And, um, and, and one of the things that I also want to share, and I'm going to give JJ an opportunity um, to uh, speak. She's part of our autism response team. And I think that her information is so important, is that on August 13th, we will be um, having another webinar, a webinar for your community. And uh, we'll be sending out invites for that. So be on the lookout for those invites that will be coming out soon. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, our Autism Speaks uh, Blue Blessings, which is our faith initiative um, to uh, help bridge that gap um, between underserved communities and Autism Speaks, as well as to provide um, the faith communities with resources that are available to help um, their members and their congregants and synagogues, um, you know, all of them with resources that would be helpful to help your families. We're also going to have a representative from our autism response team, and we're specifically also going to be talking about staying safe, you know, uh, of what's taking place in our country uh, with, with schools now being, you know, just things are up in the air about whether or not schools will start back. And, and it's going to be uh, a lot of information that will be helpful and resourceful for your family. So again, we look forward to have you join us, um, you know, as we share those important information on those topics. Uh, so no matter what, you know, just hang in there and remember that Autism Speaks is always here to help. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to JJ, uh, who is uh, our amazing Autism Response Team Associate, and she's part of our services and support team. So JJ, I'll turn it over to you now so that you can provide some help and resources. Thanks, Janet. Again, my name's JJ, and much like um, many of my colleagues here at Autism Speaks, I also am a mother of a child with um, autism. He's turned 15 this summer, and he too is struggling with um, the challenges, um, not only that puberty brings as a teenager, but also the COVID and, and school services stopping. Um, so we've had to find a balance as well. Um, 
So please know that we, we all can relate and, and understand to these difficult situations. Um, Judith, if you'll flip the slide over to the next. Um, I wanted to share these. And again, you all um, that are registered will be receiving um, this webinar. So you'll be able to click onto these links to find some of our most common resources that have been requested. Um, for many of us, we rely on summer camps, um, different kinds of therapy programs, added therapies in the summer, vacations, those kinds of things that have unfortunately a lot of times been canceled due to COVID. Um, so our team has uh, worked with several other autism organizations to put together a great um, website page full of virtual um, summer activities, summer indoors, outdoors, um, online, Many of them are educational, and I know that we have discussed about a lot of schools in Tennessee and in the South um, are, you know, going to be only opening virtually, um, you know, come next month. And so I would encourage you all to, to click that top link about with the learning activities. There's some really great um, homeschooling and online support resources that could be helpful for you and your family. Um, I did go ahead and put it in the chat box, but that second link there is the one that Janet um, referenced that's going to provide resources for it. When you click on that link, there's different options. There's um, for educators, there's for parents, there's for um, uh, communities. And so it's a, it's a great way to find social and teaching stories if you're worried about how to help your child wear a mask or uh, hand washing um, teaching stories just a variety of different things that we're all thinking of um, there's also a, a great article um, on um, talking about that telehealth piece that we've discussed already and then just some information about um, teaching your child or your loved one with autism about COVID and how uh, to stay on top of those latest trends. So we definitely um, are actively working on providing you all with the latest um, and best practiced information um, for you and your family. Um, please know that you can contact us anytime. Um, the Autism Response Team is available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. And you can call us, you can email us, you can live chat us, you can social media us. We are available almost all of the ways. So um, feel free to reach out. If you have a specific question, if you're trying to find an ABA provider in your area because you want to add that service in now that your child isn't going back to school, or you need an online support group right now, or those sorts of things, or financial issues, please, please uh, send us an email at help at autismspeaks.org or give us a call. And that number and information, everything is going to be on the slides. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. This is Kelly. Judith had to hop off to another call. But I really want to thank all my colleagues as well as Karen. We were so appreciative of your time and expertise. Um, thank all the participants for joining us. We hope it's been valuable and we will be sending out to you um, either today or, or soon the recording and the slides that have links within them that you can use. Thank you, take care and have a good rest of your day everyone.